Hello and welcome to the Ace Podcast with me, Pete Perfides. To borrow a title from the gentleman we're about to meet, it's nice to be out in the morning, especially when it's a sunny morning in northwest London and you're at the house of one of the truly great songwriters of his generation. This gentleman first came to wider attention via the hits he wrote for artists such as the Hollies, Herman Herman's Hermits and Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders. He reclaimed some of those songs for a solo album that now changes hands for eye-watering amounts of money and of course from the 1970s he enjoyed unparalleled success as part of 10CC. The muse has never abandoned him though and he bounced from one inspired collaborative project into an another when he worked with Andrew Gold in Wax over the course of four albums. Since then he's worked alone and with songwriters ranging from Kirsty McColl to McFly. His most recent solo album Love and Work reveals an artist who still appears to know a few hitherto undiscovered sources of low-hanging melodic fruit. Last year, he also enjoyed a spell on the road with one of his heroes, Ringo Starr, and his all-star band. It's a pleasure to meet Graham Goldman. Hello. How Can I just correct you on one thing? Yes. <laughs> I haven't been toured with Ringo Starr yet. Did you not? No, I'm but actually going to do that this uh, coming May. Well, you must be very excited about I- that. I'm extremely excited about I'm it. I'm excited on your behalf when I read about it. That's <laughs> yeah. why I had to put it in the intro. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled, really looking forward to it. It'll be something very different for me to be in a band that I'm not uh, looking after. Um, I'm quite looking forward to that, actually. Well, that, it, that yeah, that, it, that sort of had, had occurred to me because mm. you're sort of, the kind of pressure's off it. You get all the all the good things, but kind of none of the kind of pressurising. That's things. right, yeah. Although the pressure is on in that I'm learning about 25 new songs, well, songs that I haven't played. Of course, some of them I, I know yeah, and have yeah. known most of my life, yeah, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, so that's not a problem. But some of the other ones are... Uh, a little more, um, you know. I need to. I need to learn them properly, and and, and I'm, I'm learning different vocal parts as well, backing vocal parts. But I'm very excited about it, and it's going to be great. Who did you get the call from? I got a call from a uh, Ringo's, one of his uh, production managers, a guy called David Hart. And uh, actually, I was first contacted about two years ago to do it, and the. Um, bass player that's been with the band in this itineration for about six years Richard Page was leaving the band and I was going to come in but then he decided he wasn't leaving the band, that's the story I heard Hmm. so um, I just sort of kind of forgot about it and I mean (laughs) talking, I mean it's a good place to start in a way because I wanted to sort of ask you about the Beatles really because I, I would imagine that you know, for your younger self, as a, mm. as a very young man, with aspirations to, who wrote songs and presumably, you know, wanted to perform them. Yeah. You know, you you sort of grew up. You know, before the Beatles, it was an it was an era where sort of traditionally the songwriter and the artists, yeah, were kept separate. They were. I mean, the the thing was, you uh, you go down to Denmark Street. Uh, in London and go around the publishers asking for songs if you didn't have your own. Mm. But the Beatles were responsible for breaking the whole thing wide open, inspiring, uh, asp- inspiring, aspiring songwriters to actually do it. Uh, also, we wanted to be the Beatles and uh, the only way we could do it is to do what they did. Hmm. And um, so we did. <laughs> we tried to do it anyway. Well, I mean, it is, you know, uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up because certainly, the, you know, it's almost to, to sort of ha- to watch that happen, it must be like watching, seeing the, 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 the sort of seeing the workers seize the means of control. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, the whole uh, era of the 60s was one of we can do it you know, of not accepting the, the, the normal rules of how things are done, i.e. that there were songwriters separated from yeah. artists and the songwriter yeah. would go to the... the artist would go to the songwriter, sorry, and ask for a song. Yeah. Suddenly, this all changed. And without the Beatles, uh, I can safely say there would have been no 10CC. I wouldn't be talking to you today. Yeah. It's as yeah. simple as that. They were... It was a revolution. Did you have a plan B? Is there a parallel world in which... I didn't need a plan B. <laughs> there was only plan A. Because I knew what I wanted to do when I was 
given my first guitar at the age of 11. So I was always very blinkered, single-minded about. And I also was lucky because I couldn't do anything else. But I wasn't it, very good in school. And my, fortunately, my parents uh, recognised that I had a gift and didn't drive me mad to study and go to university. So you're not the sort of person who... Because I've got, you know... I've got friends who, are, you know, are equally, if not more, passionate about music and record collecting as I am. But they're kind of happy to sort of they've got their they've got normal jobs and they're content in themselves. Yeah. And they're not they're not eaten up with regret that they didn't form bands or become like music writers like me or whatever. Um, you're were you, were you not one of those people? No. I, well, for me, as I say. There's only ever been one, one road to take. And, um, I mean, when people say, well, if you didn't do this, what would you do? You know, I can think of things that I wouldn't... But you wouldn't have settled for an office job, like, you know, for instance. It's hard to say. I mean, I did work in a gents' outfitters for uh, two years. And... um, Where where was this? That was in um, Eccles New Road in in, uh, in Salford. Um, And... uh, that was very good for me because I, I wrote part of For Your Love in that shop. <laughs> and uh, eventually, I was working with a band called The Mockingbirds. Um, one of the members was Kevin Godley. And um, we were working, we were getting a little bit of work. We were semi pro, but I was leaving the, off, the shop earlier each day to go and do gigs or coming in late the next morning because yeah. we hadn't arrived home until four o'clock in the morning the previous morning. And eventually the boss did me a favour and sacked me. And um, I'd already met Harvey Lisberg, who was my manager for a long time. Mm. And he was the only person that said, this is good news. You can now just write songs. Because uh, already, I'd already started writing. And within six months, um, I had a hit with the Yardbirds. Wow. So you, you, was it a kind of, when you were sacked, was it a sort of, was it a kind of, you know, you can be sacked in a kind of angry way, or you can be sacked in a kind of, you know, you can be, you know, your head's not in this. Be, be gone, away with you. Uh, it was very nice to me, the guy, though, when he, when he, when he, he's actually a family friend. Huh. And, um, and there was no, I was kind of relieved, you know, <laughs> and... But because immediately the fact that Harvey said, I'll pay you a retainer and you come into the office and write songs every day. And I met Eric through, Eric yeah. Stewart through that, yeah. that, being at that office and, and many other people. Um, so, you know, every cloud. Well, it's great to have someone who believes in you as well. And to, to, That's what's say. important. Yeah. So, you know, there's a combination of things. You've got to have a gift, obviously, but having encouragement and being lucky enough to meet the right people. And I think also, one thing I always stress is the time, the age that I was, being where I was in that era of a musical explosion, mm. headed by the, uh, by the Beatles. But just as important, I think, um, were the, the, the bands that I admired that preceded the Beatles. And that whole era of, say, from going from Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, um, the Everleys, uh, right through the Skiffle era, which was incredibly important. That was, your, that was really when you first thought you could do it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it, 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 in a way, that was the... As far as playing was concerned, then it was like every amateur could could play and it was it was it was almost like a kind of punk era where well, it, yeah. in, in, in an odd sort of way that suddenly everybody thought oh I can play that guitar well our guitarist because I used to play a, like bongos or something yeah uh, had a guitar that doesn't mean he could play a guitar but he had one yeah. and that seemed to be good enough and do we and just to put us in the frame in terms of skiffle how much of a sort of was it was it um, you had really supportive parents, but yes. you know, in in another family, c- could it have been seen as a sort of threat for someone's child that, <laughs> to sort of be doing that? Was it? Did it have that punk aspect to it? I, I don't. My, well, my parents never saw it like that, and I think one of the reasons was because my dad was a writer, you know, who's an artistic man, 
um, and so was, was my mother. Um, so I was lucky in that respect, as in, in that they, they were sympathetic. And I was so passionate about music that they recognised uh, that that was the, the road I was going to take. That's very civilised, progressive sort of attitude, really. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, and uh, you mentioned the Mockingbirds. Yes. And um, you were in this quite sort of paradoxical position with them, weren't you, really? Because you were... You were wouldn't you open for the for the, were you the warm-up band for the, for the recordings of early recordings at the top of the pops? Yes, we did a couple of stints being the warm-up band, and um, the odd occasion, uh, well, it was a strange occasion when the Yardbirds were actually on that top of the pop. So we were warming up, <laughs> and then being pretty much ignored, and then the Yardbirds came on and did uh, "For Your Love." And how did that feel? Great. <laughs> I had no problem with it at all. No, I don't, I don't suppose you did. I didn't, you know, people say, oh, well, didn't, didn't you want to have hits on your own? Well, I was, imagine, 19-year-old 19, 19 guy suddenly having people like the Hollies and the Yardbirds recording and Hermes Hermits recording your songs. Mm. I had absolutely no complaints whatsoever. I mean, I, lo I loved playing and I wanted to play and I was continuing to play no. in, in the band. And this all came obviously before it, the dream came true, and we formed 10 CC. But you were in the thick of it. I mean, it must have been nice to be in the thick of it. And to, there must have been a point where there must have been, I'm imagining, correct me if I'm just, just surmising here, that, mm. you know, the first time you arrived at Denmark Street, maybe people didn't know who you were, but, you know, further down the line, then you, you, the, you know you must have seen people change around you as 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 this perception that you could sort of supply someone with hits. Uh, yes, it it did, and you know people you started getting calls from from people, and it was very exciting. I was very flattered. Did you ever work to specific commissions? Um, Would someone say I need this kind of song for my act? I think I did. Yes, and I was pretty good at doing that. Or I would listen to them and sort of absorb their kind of style and what they they liked. Um, I mean, Bus Stop was written specifically for the Hollies. Wow. Um, because they'd already recorded Look Through Any Window. And that was um, the song that I really thought I'd hit the nail on the head with that one. It's what, what can I say? It's one of the greatest songs of all time. Thank um, you. You know, well, thank you. you know, but, um, <laughs> Um, it's funny that you should say that about kind of writing for specific people because I was thinking about this earlier on and I think, you know, for me, you're, you're second only to Smokey Robinson in, in the kind of I don't have to look at the credits to know who that is state. Oh, really? OK, that's, that is great. You can... The, the, there is a... Yeah, I guess... I'm, I mean, I'm aware of it myself. I go through eras, or periods of time, I should say, of favouring certain... It's not even a musical style, but it can be. I found this chord, and I'm going to use it to death. <laughs> okay. And, so what was what was I hearing again and again? Well, what you're know. hearing, I think, what you're referring to. There's a lot. There's a couple of things. First of all, I do favour minor keys. Hmm. They speak to me much better. They're kind of blue and soulful, and major keys are kind of a bit white. Mm. Not in a bad way. Mm. <laughs> I'm not being racist. <laughs> but um, also, uh, one of the songs that made an incredible impression on me was The House of the Rising Sun. Mm. And that chord sequence, in my head, was kind of the reverse of the white crooner pop um, chord sequence, which... If you're a musician, you'll know a C, A minor, F, G. Hmm. Well, this was A minor, C, D, F. So it was almost t turned it upside down yeah. or certainly changed it around with one, obviously, chord hmm. uh, completely different. And I fell in love with that chord sequence, particularly the minor to the relative major. Hmm. And I used that on For Your Love. I used it on No Milk Today. I didn't use it on Bus Stop. I've used it on 
loads of stuff and it's just like in my DNA to, yeah. to do, have for that chain, that chord chain. I was lucky enough to interview um, Paul McCartney once and um, we were talking about Penny Lane and I was saying that's that song and to a certain degree when I'm 64 has it actually first time I heard that song it was just a happy song it, that was that was all it was to yeah. me it was I liked it but it was just a happy song and there's just some kind of slow release melancholy that kind of just gets bigger and bigger with the passing of years in that song and uh and now it kind of slays me when I listen to it. And there are various reasons for that, I think. You know, it's kind of, you know, the the kind of videotape of memory paused on a scene to which you can never yeah. return, all that sort of thing. He seemed completely unsurprised, as if he can, he'd meant it all along. And he said, well, there you go, you see. Sort of in, 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 in that moment of happiness, there's this... There's this sort of sadness, and I sort of get this with you as well, really. Yeah, there's a melancholy. I, I do like melancholy, I must say. Yeah. When um, this might sound a bit odd, but if I, you know, we play, there's certain songs that people say, you know, you played that song. There's one song in particular that I wrote with Andrew Gold called "Ready to Go Home," hmm. and on several occasions, people have come up and said, "You made me cry." Yeah. Now that to me is means I've done my job. It's a I want you song, to, yeah. you know, feel what I felt when I wrote it, and. Um, it's very it, it's very gratifying, even though because, of course, crying is like laughing. You know, it's a release. Yeah, yeah. And people feel good about it. Absolutely, yeah. And that's one of the. That's one of the joys of. Writing music, of course, you're doing it for yourself in, in, initially, and um, but when people say, "God, you know, that really helped me through this time," or, that song means I, so much to me, or I remember someone that I lost. When as soon as I hear that song, that is amazing to 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 have that to be able to have done that. Well, yeah, it's that kind of it's a wonderful life thing. You know, you've got like an, a kind of an imaginary ghost leading you around a world <laughs> where, you know, where this would have happened and this would have yeah, happened. It's all, yeah. you know, what an amazing sort of like thing to have in your life. Yeah, and it's even in you know, like I mentioned it earlier on, but it's a song like "It's Nice to Be Out in the Morning" mm. by um, that has that see that. Has it? to the relative <laughs> major. Okay. <laughs> it's um, and it's kind of interesting hearing a band like Herman's Hermits um, kind of uh, carry the weight of a song like that because um, it kind of, it's because um, it kind of make, it kind of makes it more potent in a way that sort of someone you know who like Peter Noon who has you know people perceive him in a certain way. You, and that, you mean as a kind of a pop like a. Cute, like pop a lightweight star. sort of character. Yeah, uh, yeah but yeah. that song has quite a lot of melancholy in it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, and yeah. it's also very Mancunian. I think it's very, it's very northern. Well, it's got the references. Obviously, it was well. just even without the references, yeah. it, there's something about it that makes me. Well, I, th I think obviously the references are important, but they, there's something about the music, and I suppose that's putting the music and the those lyrics together. Uh, that they work for a reason. And I must give credit to my dad, who I, I spoke about earlier, because he used to help me with lyrics mm. on, on those early songs a lot. I mean, he'd come up with phrases, some time write chunks, or I'd write something, mm. give it to him, and he'd go, oh, you can do better than that, let's change this and that. So I was really lucky uh, 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 and to have a, a lyricist in the house. <laughs> I think everyone feels a little bit envious when you talk about your dad and the kind of the, the closeness that you must have had for to be able to go to him and yeah. uh, and to to sort of have that kind of relationship with him. It's, it was uh, fantastic. It was. I, I know. It, I think it, it was unusual, and uh, but it it was um, it was wonderful. I mean, he sh he could have been a professional writer. He never was. His his range was quite limited to what the su his subject matter. Because everything he wrote had to have some sort of Jewish interest uh, to it. And, you know, fair enough. But a lot of his contemporaries were writing for uh, Coronation Street, which he could have done easily. He just wasn't interested in that. But I think when I started writing songs and he could help me, he kind of realised himself in a way. And it was, um, it was fantastic. And I think it must have been great. But you could, what was... What, what, was he a sort of an unassuming character, or yeah. was it...? Yeah, he wasn't that ambitious. 
Um, so he never, he was happy, you know, he worked with, in amateur dramatics. I hate that word amateur when I speak about my dad because he, there was nothing amateur about him. Um, he wrote stories, he wrote articles for, for newspapers. Um, but he could have been a professional writer, but he wasn't that, he, he didn't seem that bothered. He was doing it for, for the art, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas I would say, art for art's sake, money for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Which was actually one of his phrases. <laughs> yeah, I love that phrase. And it, but that's quite a cynical phrase, and it's very unlike him. And I always, when people ask me about that title, which came from him, um, I always make that point because I wouldn't want people to think that he was like that. Because he wasn't. Well, that, I think that's why I asked you if he was an unassuming character, because to have kind of derived the kind of intrinsic joy from sort of helping you. And that was kind of. If, Sort of his outlet in a way. Yeah. That was, and that was kind of fine. But by the same, and it must have been just as we were saying earlier on with you doing the Ringo dates. And, you know, it's kind of, you get the fulfillment, but not the sort of pressure or expectation. <laughs> yeah. So, which leads me to my next question. You know, when, when the success started happening um, and he was seeing his, you know, his contributions in your mm. songs you know, reach all these people. You must have had a conversation about it. Oh, yeah, we did. I mean, and, and he... we There was a tacit agreement that it would just be, like, our name on it, oh, in other one yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I must tell you that he was remunerated. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, <sure>. definitely. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in some of the projects that you're involved with that maybe people don't know so much about. Um, mm. And um, such as this period where you had a bit of a dream arrangement with the, the as the, the sort of members of 10CC um, with Strawberry Studio. Well, it seems yeah. to me like a dream arrangement anyway to have, you know, like, what, like we, the means of control, I guess. Yes. We're, well, we were very lucky in, in many respects. Um, I'll give you a little bit of history. The studio was originally started off by Eric Stewart and a guy called Peter Tattersall. It was called Intercity Studios. And this was at a time when everybody had to go down to London to go, get a proper studio. But there had been a few studios opening up in the, in the provinces and um, Eric and Peter had the, the foresight to put, get a studio together. Um, I was asked to become a partner in the studio, which I did, and Strawberry Studios was built. So what was great about it was that not only did we have a studio that Eric and I were involved with, but Eric was also an engineer. So a lot of the time when 10CC were making records, there would only be just the four of us in the studio. So if Eric was doing a vocal, one of us would take over That's on the board, incredible. which was quite unusual so there was no engineer in there because the engineer was already in the band and also you know uh, any anyone who's who's kind of works in a kind of solitary capacity in something artistic will know that there's always that moment where you have to show your work to someone else yeah but at least if there was just the four of you then that kind of probably made it better surely. well there was no one else to look at even yeah or to you know you can go <laughs> and they'd go hmm Oh, <laughs> not good, eh? <laughs> it was just up to the four of us. A lot of the time. I mean, sometimes we did... We, if the four of us were doing BVs, we'd, we'd get someone to... You know, yeah. one of the other engineers yeah. to come in. But uh, I think that was quite an in, in, important um, to us. And it wasn't just your work. I mean, you you, you worked with Neil Sedaka over yeah, two albums. we did two albums with Neil. One before we were 10cc and one after. And uh, that was that was great working with him. Uh, I think I think we learnt quite a bit from him. In he was very well prepared. He would sing the lead vocal as we were putting down a rhythm track. So Eric would engineer. I'd play. Uh, uh, me and Lol would play acoustic guitars. Kevin would play the drums. Neil would sing, play the piano, and do the vocal. And then I'd put bass on, and we'd put other stuff on later on. And now, just to kind of put it in a kind of place in time, I, 
I wasn't there, so you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just kind of guessing, you know, in terms of what I imagine was cool and what was not cool in the early 70s, that maybe some of your contemporaries might have been surprised that you would have wanted to work with Neil Stark. The whole thing with the studio was this. We did anything. We didn't mind what it was, and we were involved in quite a lot of crap. However... We looked at it like it was good for business for the studio. A lot of it was fun. I mean, we did football records. Like, we'd do Everton, we'd do Manchester City, we'd do... We didn't care. <laughs> you know, the fact was, I mean, I'm a, I come from a United family, but, uh, you know, no one had a go at me for doing it. It was like, you know, strictly business, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, but it, at the same time, it was fun. And to be able to adapt to writing or playing on these all these different records it was like any session guys you know you're a a gun for hire and you do whatever you, you have to do and but do it well i do think that sincerity is sometimes overrated in it when when appraising the, the the worth of a song yeah because there's loads of records we all love that we're not remotely created with sincere intentions it doesn't matter it doesn't matter all that matters is does it move you? Yeah, exactly. You know, the emotion, it doesn't matter. Who the emotion's can... real, even if the intentions are not. I know, yeah. It's the same with, you know, bands that are created in a committee room rather than a um, going through the, the struggles and the trauma and the, the rows and the he's in and he's out and should we do this and should we do that, that eventually comes to form something as great as, well, the Beatles, if you like. Yeah, but you know, I sort of go. I grew. I grew up reading the music press, and kind of being suckered into that sort of perception that you know it had to be kind of torn out of your very soul, and uh, it's actually quite a boring way to look <laughs> at things, really. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I've only whatever I've done. I've I've turned down things that, that yeah. right, and and. Uh, but whatever I've accepted to do, I would say nine times out of ten, I've really enjoyed it. Or I've managed to get into the mindset where I think, wow, this is really weird, but I'm going for it. And I mean, a prime example of that is working with the Ramones. I was going to ask you about which, that. Which yeah. was a, a very strange um, concept, I think, put in one of. How did it happen? Okay, I got a call from the... 1981, wasn't it? Pleasant Dreams. Okay. Pleasant Dreams was the album. They contacted me through the... Gary Kerfus was their manager, and I think he got in touch with my manager. Anyway, we had a meeting, and the first question asked was, why me? And the answer was a, an odd one. We think that we write... So our songs are sort of similar to yours. I thought, that can't be true. Just, <laughs> you, know, it can't, you know, it cannot be true. But anyway, on further questioning, it was more, they loved the British invasion. They loved all the bands that came over. And that was really the connection. Mm -hmm. So it was really, even though the songs, our songs were completely dif different, they wanted some sort of connection with that, um, with that era. And I was still a little... Um, I had some trepidation about it, uh, but I said, rather than committing to a whole album, which is, you know, not going to be good for either of us if, 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 if it doesn't work out, let's do like two or three tracks and see what happens. And that's what we did. And I said, no, we like this. And so we mm. carried on. Well, in a way, you know, if, if someone said, guess what it would sound like <laughs> if Graham Goldman produced uh, yeah. the Ramones, I did well... I think the the midpoint would be like a really good power pop album. Yeah, well, um, you know, I had nothing to do with the songwriting, only the only the production. And um, did you not slow them down a bit? I, well, I did. I maybe added things that, uh, or suggested guitar parts that were. Johnny said, because I would say, like show him something, and he'd say, "Well, you know, you play it," and so he go, but don't play anything that I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. That was the thing, which I, I dug that. And um, it's hard for me to um, 
sort of get that album into perspective. I must say, I've not heard it for a long time. I, I know Johnny hated it. Uh, Joey was an absolute dream and charming to work with, oh. and and it was worth it just to to be in his presence. He was lovely, oh. um, and um, and the rest of the boys were great. They were always on time. They were very conscientious. Joey was forever asking to go over things and can we redo this, can we redo that? To the extent when I would always say yes, but once we got to the mastering the album and he was with me in the, at the, in the cutting room, he said, is it too late? To, and I said, yes, it's too late. <laughs> we can't do anything now. <laughs> it's, quite, it's kind of quite cool that, you know, at that time, I mean, I like both. I'm not. It's not a judgment call. I like both things, you know. But like, um, Eric was working with Sad Cafe. Yes. And you're working with the Ramones. I mean, like hindsight, you know, would maybe say that you edged it there. Well, I, I'm not. I, you don't need to say that, no comment. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I love that Sad Cafe record, so, so it's fine. But it's actually one of my more, more liked Ramones records because I kind of I struggle with that kind of one, two, three, four kind of yeah, brain thing. Yeah. I know it's uncool to say it. Yeah. So it was with some relief that I heard that remote. I thought, okay, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of... What was also bizarre, in the same year, I produced an album for Gilbert O'Sullivan. What, so, the, the What's in a Kiss album? No, no, it, no, it was... No, there was no actual hit from it. That says something. <laughs> um, it was called Life and Rhymes. And it was really some really great stuff. And I'm a massive fan of his. I mean, I went into that without any, you know, with open arms mm. because I'd always admired him as a songwriter. And um, when I met him, we got on really, really well and we still keep in touch with each other. And you emerged um, into, the, into the light sort of at, at a similar time, didn't you, I guess, in the yes, early 70s? Yes, and I'd always loved his, particularly his early songs, mm. I, I thought were fabulous. And um, he's a lovely guy and I really enjoyed making the album with him. Uh, we did some of it in Ireland, some in Germany, and some at Strawberry Studios as well. And it was a real pleasure. I'm fascinated by that period in the early 70s, sort of just as kind of 10CC were coming together, uh, as, as much because of what... There just seemed to be this kind of uncertainty of what people should be doing now that the 60s and psychedelia in the, the era of the Beatles was over. And so there's this kind of nervous, well, maybe not nervous, this kind of tentative re-embracing of rock and roll, which you would see dotted around yeah. in various ways. It's kind of glam, really, is essentially a sort of slightly more... Uh, it's, a, it's rock and roll. I mean, a lot of the kind of people that kind of came through with glam were kind of people that had tried to become successful as rock and rollers. That's right. I mean, it was more simplistic music as well um, I'm not talking about people like Roxy but say people like The Sweet who made great records I mean bloody hell they were fantastic records um, and the songs or like people like Susie Quattro I think of them as great sort of like very poppy rock and rock sort of songs yeah. but I think bands like 10CC and Queen we were so influenced by the Beatles. I mean, it's blatantly obvious that we were. Uh, and we never sort of tried to hide it, although we are, lyrically we were, we were quite different, I think. But um, it was that idea of using the studio as the place to write yeah. and record, uh, well, obviously record, but I mean that we would create in the studio rather than writing a song somewhere else and going on the road with it and just doing the arrangement that suited being on the road and then just recording it. Like yeah. the Beatles' first album, the Please Please Me album, was all songs that they'd been on the road doing for years and years. That's why they could make it in however long it took, which was mm. not, not very long at all. No, I mean, there was sort of, I guess in some ways, you know... I mean, ELO as well was sort of, again, an obsessive studio band. Yes. Almost kind of like then like the live thing was almost an afterthought because it was how good a studio record can, can we make? Yeah. Um, of course, you were a very different band to ELO, but the, I guess what, what, I, what, I hear, what I hear in a lot of 10CC music is a sort of, um, a, sort of a respect for that sort of um, pre-Beatles way of making music as well, sort of a bit of Timpan Alley and sort of and, do, and a bit of doo-wop, you know. Well, there was, a, there was a whole mixture, particularly with 10CC, because remember there were four songwriters. Mm. So four different 
different personalities. We had our own individual um, people that we that we were influenced by, and we had our collective influences as well. So we all loved the Beatles. Yeah. We all loved Steely Dan. Like I think we all loved. Um, Motown mm. as well, although we never did anything no. that Motownish, which was a shame. Really, I'm sure we could have done something <laughs> there. But uh, so um, certainly, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, there were like James Jameson and uh, was like the man, um, or certainly one of the men that influenced me as a as a as a bass player. Yeah. Um, so that was the reason why we would write. We we'd write whatever we felt like. We didn't think, well, we are a something band and therefore we must do this sort of music. We did whatever we wanted. You were not afraid of being, quote-unquote, clever. Um... We weren't afraid of anything. We were... We just wanted to uh, do things that we loved, amused us, pleased us, and each, each one of us, for each other as well. Yeah, yeah. And for a time, it was, it was a dream. I mean, I, I can, I still remember listening to Kevin Lowell playing Eric and I, the Dean and I. Yeah. I thought, what the fuck? This is so <laughs> brilliant. I couldn't believe it. Eric didn't like it at first. I don't think. Why not? I don't know. I don't know. He didn't get it, but then he got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's not to get for me? <laughs> you know, it's great and a joy to record as well. You know, a great song. It's the easiest thing in the world to record it, and the opposite is true, where you struggle to find production ideas to lift something out of the hole, you which you can't, because if the song doesn't have it, you're screwed. Are there never any exceptions to that rule? Not in my experience. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, I've, I, I've realised... I've been there when there's been a turning point in a song where what you thought was an album track suddenly becomes a hit single in your head. Doesn't always happen, but that's what you think. What, give me but it did happen when, with something when we were recording the things we do for love. Right. Uh, Eric had this idea for some harmonies, and there was one particular harmony that he sang. And I said to him, "I said, this is it now. Hmm. You've just we've just gone over the tipping point." With I hear this. a lot of Paul McCartney in that so, that that song. I mean, to both, not in terms of what you were both respectively trying to do. Yeah. Um, a kind of new way of making mainstream music, a kind of clever way, a clever new way of making mainstream music that wasn't never done. And never loved, done. I no, I hope that. it was never done. And and there's a, yeah, there is Beatle influence. Uh, no, I mean, Eric could be very McCartney in his singing as well. And I was that on that song in particular, that kind of bass playing was very McCartney influenced. Well, yeah, and you know, there's a, there's just. There's just a, in the Venn diagram. There's just a kind of handful of wing songs and tenth CC songs, which you know. There's just that you know. So like with a song like you know, similarly with silly love songs or with a little love. Yeah. You know, you're kind of in the same sonic postcode. Yeah. It's nice. I think. In fact, when we were making the Sheep Music album, our second album, uh, Paul McCartney was in using our studio to record an album with his brother Mike McGear. So we would be recording during the day and Paul and Mike and their band would come in later in the day, in the evening. And, and the, the, the studio itself was completely stacked <laughs> with equipment. It was beautiful. <laughs> so there'd be that handover moment, would there? Yeah. Nice. And we'd use each other's instruments. I mean, there's, on Wall Street Shuffle, there's uh, Paul's Mellotron. And we used... Um, I can't remember the name of the drummer at the time, but we used his kit as well. So imagine, so the, you know, Paul was kind of infused into that album. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Without doing anything. <laughs> There's a lot, yeah, 10 CC's uh, back catalogue is a very satisfying back catalogue to just kind of burrow into and find surprising things that don't, yeah. maybe don't get as much attention. Like a song that I was listening to, Anonymous Alcoholic, last oh, yeah. night, which I think is from um, Bloody Tourists. Yes. And again, it's got that again. I guess that thing that really I think has dated very well because you're not sort of trying to compete with kind of passing trends, which never sort of. Go. So it's almost got that Harry Nilsson kind of feeling about uh, aspir clever classicism. Yeah, you know. good. Oh, that's thank you. Uh, you and mean? I think that that what if I can just make this point. Yeah. 
when you talk about the the songs haven't dated the fact that the I think the songs are timeless and the fact that we, uh, and one of the reasons is that we didn't follow any trends we just so it doesn't put us in the songs that aren't put in a time period and that's why the Mark III version of 10cc is still touring and still busier than ever in a way because people want to hear those songs so the personnel of the band as it is now has changed over the years obviously but it's all because of the songs and a lot of bands are doing that you know there have been personnel mm. changes so, I mean with with the, my version of 10cc now I'm the only original member but we have got Paul Burgess who joined the band in 73 uh, when the original 10cc went on the road and then when Kevin and Lyle left Rick Fenn came in mm. joined us uh, so, and he's with me as well. So, and I've got another keyboard player and, and another singer uh, and a keyboard player. So it works really well and people just want to hear those songs. Absolutely. I mean, if you weren't there to do them, presumably there wouldn't be the opportunity for people no, to hear them. No, because it's, it's not the... There aren't that many... Other, I think there are some, but there are not that many 10cc covers bands. Does it exist with the blessing of the other guys, is it? Uh, is with it? Kevin it does, but not the other guys. Oh really? Kevin's actually appeared with us. He uh, he was he first appeared with us at the uh, we did a gig in Swansea about oh, it must be about eight years ago. But uh, about four years ago we did the Albert Hall and he he came on and did some stuff. Why is Kevin cool with it, but the others not uh, not? I I don't know. Um, see, for me, it's okay to do it. I would never record under the name Ten CC. That's going too far. Hmm. But I feel, you know, it wasn't. It actually, it wasn't something that I did sort of intentionally. It kind of grew out of around '96. We did our very last gig with me and Eric, and then after that, I just started. I was writing and doing various other things and then in about 2000 I started getting itchy to play again mm -hmm. and I did these sort of acoustic gigs and then I started missing bass and I started missing I wanted mm. to hear some drums <laughs> and it kind of morphed into this thing that it is now yeah but originally I was calling it 10cc featuring Graham Goulman Graham Goulman and friends 10cc featuring and I thought oh, fuck this fuck well ev ev everyone knows don't they everyone knows that Eric's not in the <laughs> yeah picture. everyone knows yeah. now so it's okay but yeah it was like I can't can we just call it 10cc and I'll take all the shit if I get any and to be honest with you I've not had that much no, but I think people are happy that there's think, an opportunity to see yeah it. I hope yeah. so there's two ways of looking at it a part of me as a music fan kind of understands the other side yeah, yeah. But, but it's good it's to... A, a, of the two things, I've obviously lent towards doing it. And it's really because I love to play. Yeah, of course. It's, you know, life's too short. Yeah. Um, and, of course, Wax, Wax kind of grew out of 10cc. Yes, it, it, it did. Understand. And it was... Uh, well, I met Andrew because of uh, 10cc. He, uh, he was put forward to work with us as a, a producer and songwriter... Uh, by our American record company in the hope that we might be able to break into the American market, which we hadn't done with albums. We had with a couple of singles, but no, no albums. And despite touring there quite a lot, nothing, we didn't gain any traction. Hmm. But the idea was that he would bring his um, songwriting and production ability into the band and this would somehow help us break the American market. Well, it, it didn't. But it did mean that I met Andrew Gold, who I'd been a long time fan of. Uh, I loved him. I loved him. It's uh, harmonious. It was a harmonious arrangement. Wasn't yeah. Well, it? he's he's from the same. You know, his mind is the same as 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 mine in very very many ways. Yeah. He was a massive Beatles fan. He um, when we, he worked with us, although there weren't any hits, the three. Uh, songs on the album that he was involved with were all singles, which set, says quite a lot. And then Eric and I called it a day for the first time. And uh, the first person I called was uh, Andrew. And I, I said to him, 
I've I've got a little studio at my house. Come over and work with me for a couple of weeks, see what happens. And he stayed for six months. Wow. And we did a great album that nobody's ever heard on my uh, on a sort of Fostex. What the, I think it was an eight track. Well, the fourth one. It, no, it was. It wasn't any. It, it, it oh. was. It was never released. I don't think anything was released from it. But it, it's got some absolute gems on it. Be nice to hear. It's it. very, very tense. You see. So, where can hear it, Graham? Uh, yes. Um, well, actually, Andrew released some of the tracks on some albums that he put out, but they haven't got the the whole thing. I'll have to try and find it. And um, but it is great. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully one day. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, I love, um, I want to ask you about Bridge to Your Heart and the, the, right. the false start. Yes. Which is, um, I do like a false start, you know, yeah. and I sort of collect them in my head on kind of various sort of albums. I just can't believe that it kind of got left in, in a way. It's well, um, I think we did it on the demo and... We liked it. Uh, and then when we went into the studio, Chris Neal, who was our um, our producer, he liked it as well. So we kind of... <laughs> we, you know, it's like rehearsing an ad lib. We redid the false start. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember, I remember watching a, a sort of Motown, a, a documentary about Motown, and uh, Barry Gordy's talking about uh, Please Mr Postman. Yeah. And he says that, you know, the thing that hooks you in can just be over in a second. You know, it doesn't matter. Just, but if there's one in there, then it can be enough. So in Please Mr. Postman, he thinks it's uh, deliver the letter, the sooner the better. <laughs> yeah, deliver the letter. It's brilliant. <laughs> and I think there's something in that, you know. It's, uh, oh, yeah. Just as long as it's there, you know. Well, there's moments. I mean, I have a little list in my head of... <laughs> like g-spot moments yeah, in yeah. a song where you go you see god in a certain yeah. way <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um i wanted to ask you about another wax song which uh i was listening to recently. i have occasion to listen to it from time to time because the, the kind of the way the world is kind of demands it that i listen to it. i'm talking about in some of the world yeah which is just a song that you could have written yesterday in terms yeah. of what, you know, it's a political song. Yeah. Um, of course. And we made, a, we made a video for that with uh, Storm Thorgerson. Um, yeah, you know, the, the songs I wrote with Andrew, I think it's like some of the best things that, that I've been involved with. Mm, mm. I, I loved working with him. He was a... He was... He was a, a master of all trades. He, he was a brilliant guitarist, a great drummer, a fantastic singer, great keyboard player. I mean, he was extraordinary. And, and, um, and he was a wonderful, he was a wonderful person. I think both what you, I mean, it's, um, the, I guess the contrast between that and uh, 10CC is that there's a kind of, both what you and Andrew did, it has this kind of tremendous life force to it. It has. It's got more... Uh, it, yeah, it does. I agree. There's an energy yeah, to it. It's nice. It's, yeah. it's, uh, um, but and you have that, obviously. I want to ask you about Love and Work, which is yeah. your most recent solo album. And uh, just a, a, a couple of songs in particular. We can't go into everything. But um, well, I want to ask you about the first song first. There's a song that it opens with called The Halls of Rock and Roll. Yeah. And uh, I just thought it was very moving to see that that love of records is the, that kind of childlike, the, the love of records that presumably wanted to make you do this in the first place. Yeah, it's and clearly to, there. Yeah, and giving credit to people that work behind the scenes. That was the kind of idea, whether it be engineers in recording studios, people that work in, in radio stations, whether they're DJs or the, the guy that just gets the records out for him or whatever. Yeah. And um, it was a paying homage to those that have gone before us because we wouldn't be here without them. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's true. And paying, you know, I'm thinking of people like, particularly people like Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran um, and the Everly Brothers, who uh, we know that the Beatles 
were mad, were tremendously influenced by them, and so it's gone on. Yeah, that yeah. I was and Ten CC were, and and loads and loads of other bands, of course. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of. Um, I felt like with this album, you kind of maybe reconnected with that kind of na- na- naive sort of sense of wonder about the kind of the possibilities of just picking up your guitar and yeah. not overthinking it, just sort of seizing the moment. Well, a lot of the songs on that album started the way out, the way I used to write in the in the 60s, which was just me sitting in the bedroom. I don't know, something about a bed and the guitars, maybe because I can put a couple of guitars on this big area or, yeah. rather than being on the floor or stands. I don't know, there's just something... <laughs> Because I always start, wrote in when I was uh, at home with my, when I was living with my parents. Uh, that was where I would go and write. Well, when your kids have grown up as well, you can be a bit more childlike again, can't you? Because the kind <laughs> of slightly tawdry kind of logistical worries of the day, yeah. a lot of them are gone. So That's you, true. you can be a bit like self-indulgent in that, that way. That and I think with age also, um, you. You kind of go back to old ways. It's it's quite nice. I mean, I, I, with, I've been used to with with if I'm collaborating with people that play keyboards, and there's always the same sort of thing. I mean, Eric and I used to always write where he would play keyboard, I would play guitar, and it was pretty much the same with Andrew as well. Although we used drum machines quite a lot as a as a sort of backdrop to the song that we were writing. But uh, I, I really went back to um, how I started, and because I, I, it's the it's the old thing of if it sounds good with one guitar and voice hmm. and one vocal, when you make the record, it's going to be brilliant. Yeah, that's a good yardstick, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about another song on that record, uh, "Lost in the Shadows of Love." Which yes, is just I wrote cause... that with uh, Henry Priestman. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a sort of again. It's gone to that kind of. Uh, lovely baroque sort of uh kind of um yearning sort of quality about yeah. it yeah that that was a, a a an example of my uh, the chord of the year or the chord really? sequence of the okay. it's sort of a descending sixth <laughs> don't say that with a lisp um and uh, that features that so i can i can listen to songs and go oh yeah that chord again, or that sequence again. <laughs> Hello, old friend. <laughs> it's an old friend. And actually, that's not a bad way to describe them as old yeah, yeah, friends, yeah. because they're very good yeah. old friends, and they've, um, you know, I can just pick them out and go... I mean, I can be writing sometimes, I think, with somebody, if I collaborate, I think, I need to do something here. I go, I'll just nick this in. And it always works. People go, wow, that's beautiful. What's that? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I love that song. It's oh, there's quite a McCartney influence on there as well. You can yeah, hear a little the, bit maybe kind of guitar. shades of for no one or maybe um, uh, Blackbird. Yeah, Blackbird, Blackbird. Yeah, it has that um, yeah. that sort of feel. Um, and uh, you, I mean, it's been a while now since that record. You must have kind of stacked up a few that are ready to go for the next one. Well, I released another um, an EP, a six track EP called Play Nicely and Share. Right, okay. Um, because, and I did an EP because I didn't have time to do an, an LP. And my plan is to do another EP and maybe put them together. Good idea. And, yeah, um, and the, I, I, you know, I get, I get to a point where there's a lot going on, but I need to record something. I, mm. It's like, a, like anything in my professional life, the three things are songwriting, playing live, and, and, um, and recording. Mm. And I need them all. And wh- whichever one I'm doing is always, this is the best thing in the world that I could do. <laughs> and I feel incredibly lucky because of that. Well, it's nice to be, you know, it's nice to be in the company of an enthusiast. And, you know, your work, and, you know, it's not like it would, you know, your work is demonstrably the work of an enthusiast. And it's nice to sort of, that what is so abundant in you in person is also abundant in the work. Yeah, good. I'm glad, I'm pleased to hear that because it's true. You know, I don't. Um, I'm lucky that I, I said I think earlier on that uh, I haven't in my working. You know, I haven't got any other interests. My love is my work and my family, and um, well, love and work. What can I say? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, hats off. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Graham Goldman, uh, it's been a delight to spend the last hour with you, mm-hmm. and uh, as part of the uh, on the Ace podcast. And uh, keep my love to Ringo. I will do. (laughs) 
You've been listening to the Ace Podcast. For more excellent music, you can scoot over to the Ace Records website, www.acerecords.co.uk, for all the wonderful music you could possibly need. <laughs>